Welcome everyone to our next talk as part of CPO Mastery Series Conference. We're thrilled to be joined by Scott Belsky, who is a Chief Product Officer and EVP at Adobe. Scott was a founder and CEO of Behance, the world's largest network of creative professionals, and is the author of the book, Messy Middle, which is a required book for every entrepreneur, business, and product professional. Our talk today will center around key ideas from Scott's book and how they apply to your company, your product, and your career. Scott, it's great to have you here. Oh, of course, thanks for having me. Awesome. You have a really unique background. Could you talk a little bit about your journey from Behance to Adobe, as well as your current scope and mandate at Adobe? Sure. You know, I, I think that I've always been a bit of a product obsessive, so I feel like I'm in a, a real community of friends here. Um, Behance was uh, and, con and, ten and continues to be uh, a, a, a product intended to help organize creative people. Um, the idea of you know, a lot of creative careers at the mercy of circumstance, a lot of work that gets done. You can never actually know who did it. It's very little attribution in the creative industry. And, uh, and we also know these days that designers change everything, you know, that uh, every experience, digital, physical, advertising, anything that compels us to take action on anything is ultimately touched by the hands of a designer or a creative professional of some kind. And so Behance was an, an effort to help organize the creative world. And in the process of doing that, you know, we had to solve a lot of design problems. We had to build a, um, uh, a bit of a uh, marketplace of talent, um, a you know, portfolio powering platform, um, and you know, really crack a lot of uh, challenges that relates to you know, posting and streaming multimedia on web, et cetera, back in the early days when the company was founded in 2006, 2007. Um, so that, that was a great journey. You know, it was uh, five years of bootstrapping, uh, two more years as a venture backed business. And then we were uh, acquired by Adobe in 2012. And, um, and the idea of coming into Adobe was we wanted to really get into the tools of creativity themselves. We really wanted to connect the creative world, not only after they were done posting to their portfolio, but at the point of creation itself. And so over the years, our team has not only integrated Behance into a number of our products, um, uh, but also, also tried to bring community to other parts of the product line of Adobe, um, really started to think about uh, Adobe as a as a services company that was on an ongoing basis delivering value to customers, uh, helping people collaborate, helping teams work together, um, helping people get inspired by the community, helping people learn the products. You know, another big problem I came into Adobe trying to solve was all these people come trying to use a product like Photoshop, and then a lot of them open it and are scared by this cockpit of controls. And you know, how do you how do you uh, really you know? demonstrably change engagement and retention, right? Which is a good thing, of course, for both the customers and the business by helping people be successful in the products. So, um, so at Adobe, I you know, had a few different roles. You know, I, I came in leading Behance. I took over all of our mobile strategy back in 2013, 2014, and then Creative Cloud Services after that. Uh, left for a little while to do some investing full time and kind of collect myself after 10 years of doing this stuff and then missed it, came back, jumped in as a, in this chief product officer role, overseeing all of product engineering and design for the, uh, for the digital media creative business. You know, five years of bootstrapping Behance, um, you know, that is not what a lot of executives do. So how has that led you to be a different product executive than maybe some of the other uh, executives that have just grown up and have a stable salary every time? Well, it's interesting, you know, whether you have a, a stable salary and a set number of resources or headcount that you're given every year at a big company, or whether you have a lot of capital that you raise from venture capitalists as a small company, in both of those instances, when you have a challenge, you throw money at it, you throw people at it, you throw resources at it. Whereas when you're bootstrapping in a, in a, in a small business, very hand to mouth mode, um, you don't have the resources to throw at problems. And so you have to do is constantly refactor how you do things, you know, change the operating structure, refactor how people work, you know, constantly try to find efficiencies. And, uh, you know, that all led to my strong belief that resourcefulness is much more valuable than resources. 
you know, resourcefulness to me is like the muscle, whereas resources are the carbs. Resources just kind of go away. They may temporarily uh, extinguish the problem, but the problem, the root cause of it, you know, you haven't been improved as an organization as a result of resources, whereas resourcefulness um, is a skill that never leaves. Um, and so I, I encourage all teams, even when they do have the cash, to find ways and forcing functions to develop resourcefulness and how they work. That's awesome. That's great advice. Let's dive into the me messy middle of companies. And you know, Adobe transitioned to a subscription model, which is one of the most successful transitions of any Fortune 500 company. Everything is changing about the company. Can you share a little bit about the key lessons that you know, Adobe learned from this transition? Yeah, I think a few things, you know, um, number one is uh, it's one thing to do a business transformation. You know, it's an entirely different thing to do a product transformation. And admittedly, we really started with the business transformation, which was we're going to take these products and we're going to sell them in a different way. But, you know, day two, they didn't change so much, frankly. Um, you know, and I think customers rightly so said, wait a second, like, you know, how is that, you know, how is that any better for me? Um, you know, for many customers, it was better in the sense that these are now more affordable. Instead of having to pay north of $1,000, you know, in one pop, you could for as little as 10 bucks a month, um, you know, start getting, um, you know, some of these products. Um, uh, but but, but what, what real, you know, demonstrably different, you know, step function better value could we deliver as a result of this new business model? And, um, and so what we, what we realized in the first few years was that, I mean, my goodness, not only could you update these products every, you know, every few weeks or every month and have the incentive to do so as a company, as opposed to every 18 months when you, you know, ship the new binary, um, but you could also start to really tune into other problems that customers were having. How do I work with others? Oh, I want to work on, on this new thing called the iPad, but I don't know how to, you know, will Photoshop ever be on iPad? And, and you know, all these different questions that, you know, a lot of the solutions all required a few specific things. They required cloud documents and cloud files as opposed to local files. They involved a whole identity system so people could collaborate with one another and share. They required people to have access to their assets wherever they were across any device that they were using. And so that, you know, that set of customer needs coupled with this new transformation we made on the business side unleashed you know, uh, a decade of innovation on the product side that much of which is actually just now coming to fruition, frankly, because you had to build a whole cloud services organization and infrastructure, you know, these products, these are 30 plus year old products in some cases like Photoshop, you know, to reimagine Photoshop, real Photoshop for an iPad or maybe even other surfaces in the future, you know, is a, uh, is, is a multi-year strategy. And so you just have to stay patient. You have to really align around the long-term conviction and you have to keep the, keep the team sticking together long enough to figure it out. Amazing. Um, and that is a big transition for a company. Now talking about the messy middle for product, you know, many companies are on their journey of developing consistent design systems. Could you talk about the lessons learned and the benefits realized as Adobe transitioned to a consistent design system across all their products? Yeah, so we have internally, we have a system that we call Spectrum and it's uh, managed centrally by a design organization um, that every team has to align with around the company. And uh, you know, there's a lot of constituencies and it's always tricky to make sure you don't solve down to the lowest common denominator, you know, that is um, just doesn't, you know, at the lowest bar for every individual product. And so I think that team, you know, has had the struggle of figuring out, okay, what are the, what are the absolute key parts that are consistent that are, you know, we all agree with and are good for all of us um, and that allow a customer who knows how to use one product, pick up and just start using another product without having to figure out the whole nav and the UI all over again, right? There are a lot of benefits to that and there's some trade-offs to be made there, you know, versus what are the spaces of every product that each product should sort of innovate on their own around because it's very native to the video customer, video editing customer versus the, you know, the illustrator um, or the customer in InDesign. So um, that was, you know, that was part of the process. Um, we, of course, it was also a bit meta for us because we were using our own design system tooling to bake our design system. And the one we were making was influencing the one we were building for others. And so it was a very kind of meta uh, process. 
because um, our design system is built on uh, Creative Cloud libraries and the design system that's in Adobe XD, which is our experience design product. And what's what's cool about that is that it all kind of fits, right? So if you're if you're doing something in Illustrator or Photoshop, you have the same assets at your fingertips that you would if you're you know building the product experience and the prototypes in Adobe XD. Um, and so we you know we we've been sort of our, our own first customer customer zero as we like to call it, right? Um, to uh, to build um, our design system and four design systems. Awesome. Now. What are some common traps that you've seen product managers fall into during the messy middle of product discovery? Yeah, I mean, product discovery and traps, you know, um, well, I'll say a few different, a few different thoughts on this and I'm happy to go in any other direction uh, you have. You know, number one, you know, I, I also um, am, a, am you know, involved as an advisor and investor in a number of startup companies over the years. And, 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 uh, and the ones that haven't worked were still in incredible founders and actually great ideas, but the product process was really driven out of passion for a solution to a problem, as opposed to empathy with those suffering the problem. And there's a really distinct difference with the passion approach. You can build an incredibly beautiful, elegant, full featured product that ends up being 30 degrees off of product market fit, right? And you wonder how could people not be using this? And in my experience, it's often, you know, that gap can be attributed to the lack of sitting next to people and feeling their frustration on a daily basis. You know, really tuning into that empathy piece because those, those, those observations, you know, develop your intuition as a product leader Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, the, the, and then that influences the little things you prioritize or deprioritize from the MVP. You know, it, it, it impacts the way you do the onboarding. It impacts the way you do the copy on the sale page. And, you know, these little things add up, in my view, to the difference between product market fit and lack thereof. That's interesting because you, you need the passion to get you through the messy middle and the ups and downs but you need to turn it off when it comes to empathizing per se, because really built for your customer, but you need that passion to drive you through all, through the ups and downs. And if you're, you know, if you're doing almost every day behind a screen building, you know, it's, um, you know, you're doing something wrong because uh, there's just nothing that beats having to really sit and watch customers either use your product or the early you know, beta versions of it, or, seeing how they work today, you know, and the workflow that you're trying to replace with your product um, or the consumers, you know, doing what they try to do today without your product. And then you can start to really get a sense for those frustrations. Another thing, just speaking of customers, is which customers you engage first, you know, and it sounds like a luxury problem. I mean, as, as product leaders, we should take any customer we can possibly get, right? But you know, I actually do believe that there's an order of the types of customers you ideally want and should target, and maybe sometimes even limiting the number of customers you engage to. You know, and I think it's, I sort of see it as five, you know, different phases. You have the willing and the forgiving, and then you have the viral, and then you have the valuable, and finally you have the profitable. And let me just explain. You know, the willing and forgiving. Like the willing are the people who are willing to jump into something without onboarding without any like thing working, maybe you, maybe you might lose your work, maybe not. You know, these are folks who like are so deeply invested in the problem you're trying to solve that they want to almost be an extended part of your team. You know, and these willing early stage customers to me are the unsung heroes of a lot of great products out there, especially on the enterprise side, because they didn't have equity in the product. They were just, they just really cared, you know, and they were willing to partner with the product leaders to make their products great. The forgiving customers, are not really willing to jump in without the onboarding and stuff, but they're more forgiving of the things that may still be missing, right? They're they're okay with a couple of things coming soon that they would other you know other customers would ordinarily uh, find as deal breakers. The viral, the third phase of customers, these are the customers you only want to engage once you want everyone to know about it. So you don't want a viral customer, someone who's very influential, someone who has a huge Twitter audience, someone who you know always talks about new products that they're using until you really feel like you're ready to have everyone come in and start kicking the tires. And so I think that viral customers, a lot of, cus a lot of products and companies, you know, make the mistake of engaging those folks too early. Right when they launch, they're like, oh, we need the most viral customers. I believe you should get a small group of people loyally using your product 
you know, ironing out all the kinks and then get those people when you're really, really ready for them. You know, the fourth, the fourth type of customer is the valuable customer. And so these are customers where you're no longer needing to, to hold their hand. They can come in and they're low cost customers. They'll just come in and they can use your product on their own. They don't need help. And so you don't want those people because they might need help earlier on, right? You want them only when you're ready to have customers who need no help from you, right? Mm -hmm. And then the final phase of customers is the profitable ones. And this is where some companies get to the point where they even change their offering to focus on, you know, higher margin customers, you know, ones that, you know, for less effort will give you a bigger footprint. And you know, this is only applicable maybe to some types of enterprise companies and not others, but it's just important to ground ourselves with like which customers we engage at what time. Yeah, and I love the counterintuitive advice of we all do this. We all want the big influencers uh, in the beginning, but then when you don't want them because your product isn't ready to to shine yet. So, right. And moving on to the last segment of the messy middle of your career, I've spoken to a lot of product managers that feel stuck and struggling to transition to a product leadership role. What advice would you give to these PMs who are stuck in the messy middle of their career? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'll tell you, you know, having over the over over overseeing an organization of thousands of people, you know, um, the people that really stand out in meetings, and uh, you know, and the people that I see as the emerging leaders of our organization, are those that are truly the voice of the customer, are willing to mention the elephants in the room when we're in meetings, which is hard and not popular, but super important. Um, but really like the customer centric product leaders, regardless of their level of seniority, you know, shine through. Um, and then those who also build a great partnership with design, you know, as a product leader, I would say my cheat code in my career has been partnerships and relationships with designers. You know, those are the folks that help, um, you know, develop prototypes that are worth a hundred meetings. You know, that, that, that has really been the accelerant for me. And and I look for other emerging leaders in the product organization who have those relationships and, you know, and are able to, you know, on, in a united front, you know, liberating, you know, partnering with the designer, you know, show rather than tell a story. Um, and then I think finally, being able, being able to, um, to really art articulate the Zen of a product, you know, what is it really about, you know, what's the narrative? Um, you know, too many product managers are just kind of operating off of quantitative research, you know, assembling a product hit list of things that need to be done, you know, in the next quarter and the quarter after that. But when you can start to articulate, you know, here's where we're going, like here's our North Star and everything we're doing accomplishes a near-term goal, but also brings us closer to that, that long-term place we need, we know we need to be. I, I think that's, that's where you start to raise the ranks, at least in my mind, as a product leader. Awesome. So just, uh, I love the, all those points, but the last one around uh, a narrative or showing leadership of where we're headed, that's something that's important to, to you for emerging leaders. It is. Awesome. And our very last question is around the future of product management. So in your view, any trends that PM should think about, where is the future of product management headed? Yeah, I think that it's, um, well, you know, every function in the enterprise in any company these days is becoming more multiplayer, you know, meaning that instead of the functions being siloed, the tools that people are using these days, you know, are collaborative by default. Everyone's jumping in, you know, unexpected marketing uh, folks or copywriters are jumping into design files and, you know, and, and, and business leaders are jumping into prototypes. And I mean, this is just a really great thing happening. And, but what it means is that the, the lines around roles are becoming a little more permeable and, um, you know, and, and a little more gray as opposed to strike, striking bold lines. And I think that the future product leader, you know, is a very, is a very, um, you know, promotes that notion of like accessibility to, the, to their discipline, you know, is trying to get others in the weeds, you know, feeling the prototypes as they're coming together. Um, taking a real active role on social. It's amazing to me how few product leaders spend some time every day interacting with customers on Twitter. Um, it's like, it's so easy. You know, you just search your, your product's name and then you find people either praising or complaining and you engage with them. And, uh, and we talk about how important it is to be close to customers and yet everyone could spend 30 minutes every day 
engaging with customers on social without having to even spend time traveling or whatever. Um, and doing so gives you a sixth sense of what customers are talking about. It gives you legitimacy as a product leader because you're literally talking and engaging with customers every single day. So I do that and I try to throw myself in there, especially when someone's, you know, calling us out on something really stupid we did or something we really missed and made a mistake on. It's like, you know, owning up to it. Um, and, um, you know, I think is another part of like the future product leader is a little bit more accessible outside and makes their product process more accessible inside of the company. Yeah, I've watched one of your talks and I was really surprised when you are talking about the improvements, which I thought was very refreshing to see such a senior leader do that. So. It's important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time to be with us today. Your insights on effectively managing the messy middle of companies, product and career were invaluable. And for those watching, I highly recommend everyone pick up this book. It has got so many gems. Not only is it well-written, it's well-designed. Every page is a piece of art and I love, your, love all the art in here. So thank you. thank you. I'd love to get the audience to give Scott a big virtual round of applause. And thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me again. And just what a great community you're building here. It's an honor to participate. Awesome. Thanks so much, Scott.